A couple of things I, uh, I think I think I can share with you. Uh, I did have a picture. I don't know if Larry, if you're able to pull that up. Oh, there you go. David Sheridan, yesterday coming home from hospital. As you can tell, his uh, kids wrapped him up safely and put a little cushion on his chest. Um, and uh, he seems to be smiling, which is pretty good considering last Monday afternoon, not to be too graphic, they were opening him up and uh, kind of scary. So uh, here uh, within four days, uh, he's coming home and that's, that's a good thing, that's a good thing. One thing I also wanted to uh, share with you was uh, a little bit of uh, uh, update. Uh, so many of you have asked about the uh, twins and as you know, little one was born at one pound four ounces and the larger one was born one pound 15 ounces. They lose a little weight at the start and then uh, sort of begin to recover. Uh, the larger one, the big one, if you're going to use that term, uh, actually gained an ounce and so I now is two pounds, maybe two pounds and a whisker. And uh, when you consider an ounce is like one thirty second of her weight, that would be in equivalent to me gaining 10 pounds in a couple of days, which by the way I have done, uh, uh, which I'm not proud of, and I don't know why I confess that out loud. But here's the point, you know, that is a significant gain, just one ounce for that little munchkin. Um, the uh, younger one has had uh, a number, we seem to be on a constant roller coaster. The latest crisis was the kidneys, but uh, there's a little hope there that kidneys for an infant at that stage of development and so forth can uh, repair themselves. In other words, they can sort of spark up a little more, they can sort of generate a little more strength and health. So that's what we're hoping for, that's what we're praying for. We were able to go last uh, Saturday evening there and uh, this afternoon we're gonna go to Red Deer and go back again this evening uh, at least and spend a few hours uh, with the family and uh, be able to go in and uh, you can't do too much except talk to them and say, hey, Get a move on here, gain weight. Words I've never heard. <laughs> you know, hey kids, you know, it's time to pack on a little muscle here. And uh, the older one you can sort of encourage maybe with a, with a small uh, gesture. Uh, the younger one is a little awkward to touch uh, uh, because so fragile and I think the skin is uh, very fragile still at that stage. So uh, we hope for the best, we uh, pray for the best. And uh, while there is life, there is hope. And we seem to have, you know, just as I said, a roller coaster with every down, there comes a little encouragement, a little up again. So I hope to have a little more positive news again after this evening. Uh, we go to church this afternoon in Red Deer. Uh, for some reason, anytime Shelley takes in the morning service, she doesn't want to sit through it again in the afternoon. So she comes and visits afterwards, and I don't know what she does, but she doesn't listen twice. Um, Although on a rare occasion, she may punch up the video just to critique, you know, <laughs> like mother, like daughter-in-law. Anyway, this uh, coming week uh, on Wednesday is uh, a celebration for the Jewish community, especially Yom Kippur, uh, the most holy day of the year. And as an observant Jew, uh, I'm sure the uh, president's uh, son-in-law probably won't show up to work on Wednesday. I know I, uh, you know, some years ago I was watching, uh, still when Letterman was on uh, the, uh, the Late Show, um, Paul Schaefer, a good Canadian by the way, uh, is always the, uh, you know, the director of music, very talented musician, but I'll never forget the time I was sitting here watching a little Letterman, and he said, Paul's off this evening, and it was Warren Zevon or somebody else who was subbing in as the music director. Oh yeah, he's off this evening because it's Yom Kippur. And he may be a, a very secular Jew in many ways, but when the family said, Oi, it's a, tomorrow is Yom Kippur, you're not working. The most holy day of the year. The last uh, sermon I gave was on Rosh Hashanah, the day God finished creation. Uh, the day God will appear to judge his creation. The fact that God for us has appeared in the person of Jesus to call everyone to himself since he is the judge of all mankind, and he has judged the world, and in his, in his judgment, he said, I came to rescue the world, to save the world, not to condemn the world. Atonement, occurring 10 days later, you know, pretty easy to count, sort of a cycle, 
uh, a, uh, a, a cycle that you can keep track of, 10 days. Uh, the uh, commandment to all of Israel was no food. Hey, you're all going to fast that day. And no food, no water. That's it. And I suppose the lesson, uh, very first of all to the human mind, would be you are too feeble of yourself to sustain life. You need strength from outside of yourself. You need God. You need a Savior. You're at odds with that Creator God, who, by the way, is your judge. You just found that out the other day. You rehearsed that. He is the source of your life, but there is hope. You can be restored to your God. You can be reconciled. There can be atonement. And that is going to take place, and you're going to see it acted out in this pageantry. When your high priest will go into this little cubicle called the Holy of Holies, and he's going to take you with him, not literally, but symbolically he's going to take you in there, and you will be on his heart. Uh, it's pictured by a breastplate upon which were stones, precious or semi-precious stones, each one representing a tribe of the chosen people. And so the high priest literally took them in with him into the very presence of God. Uh, that's probably where we get the, uh, the idea of birth stones. I don't know what the birth dates were for the, uh, the fathers of each tribe, but uh, they came to be uh, represented by a stone. At the same time, uh, there will be other ceremonies taking place. There will be a sin offering. There will be a, 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 an offering for the sins of all the people. First of all, an offering for the priest that he will be cleansed, and then an offering for the people. And then there will be a very interesting sacrifice that won't be slaughtered, but there will be, if you will, prayer. There will be the laying on of hands, and this goat will symbolically take upon itself all the sins of the people. And then you will just take that goat outside and it'll be gone. It will symbolically remove from the camp, from the people of Israel, all the culpability, all of the sin. And so there were different ways to picture what happened to your guilt. What happened? Your reconciliation in the person of the high priest who is in the very presence of God. Your forgiveness through the shedding of blood. The removal of your sin through this symbolic animal that is sent away into the wilderness. Now, the people could rest easy. Uh, they were free of sin. And they moved on into a celebration. A celebration that was a festival of thanksgiving for the abundance of a harvest. A celebration of the gratitude for which they felt towards God who had given them all good things. Uh, but it's also in the context of a festival of remembrance. You remember when we used to live with God? What do you mean we used to live with God? Our forefathers lived in tents out in the wilderness. And they were in the presence of God. They knew it was God. Uh, there was a cloud over them to keep them cool or a pillar of fire to keep them warm at certain times. And every day, God fed us. Jehovah God fed us miraculously. We went out in the morning and there it was. And we picked this stuff up and we were nourished from on high. We lived in tents. It was a temporary situation. We yearn for a reconciliation. See, the festival wasn't just like other festivals that other people might keep which was, hey, it's, it's, the harvest is over. Let's party. Uh, we have an abundance of food. It's going to be perhaps a little lean this coming winter. Uh, and so let's just party on. Let's enjoy wine. Let's enjoy the fruits, the vegetables. Let's slaughter a few fatty calves. They've been fat, getting fat all summer. Uh, let's just have a, a wingding, a blowout, a celebration. Let's make it for eight days. And God said to them, yeah, you, you can do that. But, you know, the overtones are what? The, all these things are the blessings of God. Yeah. And furthermore, we anticipate great blessings from God in the person of a Messiah who will hopefully come and make this a permanent thing for us. Just as we dwelt in the wilderness and God was our sustenance seven days a week. So he will be with us, and he will be our sustenance.
Atonement. Uh, what does it mean? Well, we kind of know, but uh, I'll just write it down for you. It means reconciliation. It means forgiveness. Uh, we find the word only actually once in the New Testament. And it says, and gives this testimony in Romans 5 and verse 11. We also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. We are the recipients in Jesus, through Jesus, of reconciliation. He is the fulfillment of all the hopes and dreams of a day that said, look, sin can be covered by blood. Sin can be removed. Sin and all the things that separate you from your God. Uh, well, you can be carried on the heart of your representative into an intimate relationship. Just for a moment, but in the Holy of Holies. Now, Paul explains this at some length in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 11. And we just sort of jump into this and talk about how it feels to understand reconciliation and understand atonement. Not in a theological sense, but in really in a practical way. He says, since then we know what it is to fear the Lord. And that's an interesting word, isn't it? Fear the Lord. I don't know if you live in fear, but to be honest, I don't. It would be in a rather sort of nerve-wracking situation to be in, working on, walking on eggshells all the time. We're going to displease our God. Is he, is he the sort of God who sits on the edge of his throne with a thunderbolt in his hand, ready to strike down anybody who displeases him? So what does fear mean? Well, it's like the old proverb says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And we understand in its context, fear means, well, actually respect. It means reverence, uh, to hold in awe. In other words, to be impressed and steps back with a sort of a wow. Uh, we sometimes use the expression awesome. It's a very much overused word today. You know, they say, hey, uh, um, I think we have this for you. Awesome. Well, we don't really mean awesome. It doesn't blow us away. You know, if you see one of the seven wonders of the world, well, maybe that's awesome. But just, you know, getting your breakfast on time isn't awesome. It's appreciated, but it's just not awesome. You kind of can predict, you know, can predict that. And so when we talk about God, he is saying we know what it is to hold God in awe. We try to persuade others. Now, I would put it this way. If Paul is saying you should live in fear of God, well, that's kind of a tough sell. You should meet my God. Why? He scares the living daylights out of me. And he should scare you too. Well, I don't want to know that God. Well, my God is awesome. Well, why is he so impressive? Why are you so taken with him? Well, here are my reasons. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. Now, he's talking to an audience. This is a letter. And the Corinthians were a contentious lot. They were an irksome lot. And he was dealing with a group that were disconnected. They were wrought with uh, divisions. In fact, in his first letter, he says, you know, you're, you have splits and schisms. He said, uh, this is a problem. Uh, there's no unity. Uh, and in fact, you and I are at odds. You don't like me. Uh, the Corinthian church even said, you know, that Paul, well, he writes interesting letters. He writes heavy letters. But you know, have you ever met him in person? No, I haven't. What's he like? Well, he's short. He's bald, and, you know, you can relate to that. And, you know, he's not much of an orator either. You know, you're not impressed. Apollos, now, there's a great Greek orator for you. Somebody else, they're, they're impressive. But Paul, he's kind of stooped, and so forth. You know, uh, he's sort of the, uh, the Ruth Bader Ginsburg of the apostles. You know, if you see Ruth Bader, you know who she is? That little lady? On the Supreme Court, she just looks like a, like a bird. And then she speaks, and you say, oh, you re read her judgments. You think, well, oh, you may not agree with them, but they're well-reasoned. And she lays out her, you know, she's a brilliant woman. But you see her sitting there like a little bird. You think, well, she wouldn't say boo to a goose. But, well, you know, she's impressive in her writings, okay? And Paul was that way. He was fragile. He was 
old before his time. He'd been beaten up on. And, and uh, so he's saying, you know, we got problems, we got difficulties, and you have rejected me. And he is talking to them, and he said, what we are is plain to, to God. I hope it becomes plainer to you. We are not trying to sell ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is rather seen than in what is in the heart. Hey, lighten up, you guys. You're full of criticism. You know, it's uh, as Greg Williams said in his commentary, the tongue can be used for so many different, in so many different ways, and most of them are negative. You know, slash, hack, little spit of venom, a uh, little criticism, you know, uh, just that, that hurts. In fact, this is what Paul is experiencing. And he says, if we are, in quotes, out of our mind, as some say, so clearly a lot were saying in Corinth, you know, he's starting to lose it. He really doesn't connect. He's not hearing us, things like that. Woo. He says, if we are out of our mind, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, well, it's for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. Now that's a theologically heavy idea. We are convinced that one died for all. Now how does that work? Well, in Hebrew understanding, the group can be represented by one individual, the one who bears the covenant. Just as in Israel, the high priest could represent the nation. He could carry them on his heart into the Holy of Holies. And one person died for all. Paul teaches us that we are sort of, we were born dead because why? We were dead in Adam. Our ancestor blew it, and the rest of us suffered. That's the way he's explaining it to us. And so we are the recipients of death in Adam. But we are also, he says, we are recipients with, uh, of death in Christ. When he died, he took us with him. Sort of the corollary of that is when he was resurrected, we, he took us with him as well. We don't go too far down that path. But one died for all, and therefore, we all die. We suffered the appropriate death for our transgressions, our sins, our conduct, all the things that are wrong. We suffered that death in him. He died for us. He died in our place. He died on behalf. He died for all. Okay, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So the life that you have uh, is courtesy of him. It flows from him, and it's a gift from him. Oh, okay. Now he transitions. So, as a result of that, connect this thought. From now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Wow, that's profound. I mean, you can get commentaries on that. You can get books on that. You can find reams written on this idea. And as a result of Christ's death, we don't view the, view the world through our natural lens, but through his eyes. Now, through his eyes, all of humanity is saved in him and through him because he's the covenant man. He's the representative. He's the high priest. He's the one who carries all of us into a relationship with our Father in heaven. As a result of that, we say that all of humanity, whether they know it or not, are in, in Christ, through Christ, as a result of his work, quote, saved, rescued. He goes on to say a little bit more about that in a moment. But as you, world, as you look at it through your world view, uh, you would think, uh, well, really, uh, all of the vast numbers who grew up under a communist regime that completely denied God, 
uh, are they saved? Well, in Christ, yes. Uh, Vladimir Putin is saved by the action of Jesus offering himself for the world. And that would include Vlad the President. Almost in, said Vlad the Impaler, but anyway, he was a different guy. Uh, Xi Jinping, who if you asked him, uh, are you saved? He would say, What's that? what does that mean? And yet in Christ, he is saved. Um, it used to be popular, maybe a generation ago, to speak at least in terms of being nominally Christian. But it's very popular right now uh, in, well, I'd say my children's generation, to speak in terms of life is all you have. And after that, it's gone. It's ironic that, you know, it seems to go from one generation to another, from one swing to the other. And so if you talk to young people of my grandchildren's generation, they would perhaps have a little different view and a little different touch in their hearts. But Paul explains in Romans, he said, there comes a day when even the pagans will stand before God and will... He says, as a result of their life experience, and they meet this one who says, I have redeemed all of mankind to myself. I have been the atonement for all of humanity. And he said, you know, their hearts are going to be torn. And in some ways, he said, their hearts will accuse or excuse them. And he uses that as he speaks to the Jews. He said, you know, quote, they're going to be in a, in a better position than you. Why? Because you knew better, and you in your hypocrisy rejected the promised Messiah. Uh, they don't know as much as you, to whom much is given, much is expected, to whom very little came their way. Well, it's going to be easier for them. Jesus himself said, there comes a day when the men of Sodom will rise. And of course, if you want to define the ultimate sinners, who were they? Well, any Jew could tell you. Well, the men of Sodom. The ultimate sinners. He said, it'll be easier in the day of judgment for them than it will be for you guys who reject me as I stand in front of you. And so, you know, even though we don't know all of the ways that God will work out his purpose, we do know his purpose in redeeming humanity and atoning for humanity is to save humanity. And that, as again, begins to change your complete perspective. How do you feel? You know, I, uh, as he said, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. You know, I've seen lots of circumstances, heard lots of stories over the last 40 plus years. I know that uh, there are problems that exist. You know, many children have a lot of resentment towards their parents. And uh, as Christians, we use the cliche, you know, uh, uh, let go of certain things. Let go and let God hand these things over to the one who is the judge of humanity and understand that he will work his purpose out in their life. But, you know, we enter into judgment and uh, we feel certain things and so we, we, we gnash our teeth. And Jesus said, look, you know, leave it to me. Uh, vengeance is mine, I will repay. You think there should be vengeance? Trust me, I will work out justice for everybody. And of course we wouldn't trust that because, okay, now nah, yeah, but you, you sacrificed yourself for everybody. Well, that's my business, he says. So you lighten up and let go of certain things. Well, why can't I let go of certain things? Because you want to still be God in your world. But as the God of atonement and reconciliation, you're going to have to trust me, you know. So as a child, what about the tensions and difficulties you feel? Uh, well, as a parent, what about the tensions and difficulties you feel? It's very difficult to let go, especially when you feel powerless, let's say, and uh, if, if you're somebody who wants to fix things or in some way sort of heal things, and you, it's beyond your control. And you have to hand that over to somebody who is actually God. You know, I, I, I hear stories of brothers against sisters and sisters against brothers. I've uh, attended funerals where part of the family sits at the front and part of the family sits at the back because we ain't going to sit on the same row. 
Uh, I've attended numerous social circumstances and the tensions and difficulties are so real because as we say we could cut it with a knife it is a fact of life and to let go of things like that and say the God of reconciliation sees the world differently than I do well man it's especially difficult to, uh, let's say, if it's, uh, if, if it's not somebody uh, who's related to you, uh, it's uh, somebody you work with or somebody you work for, you know, situations like that. I remember many uh, years ago, I worked for uh, uh, some wonderful people. You know, Dean Wilson, the first individual I met when I came to Canada, was uh, a very uh, merciful and skilled developer of manpower. He had a lot of training in the military. He was a training officer. He's a staff sergeant, and he understood people. And he knew how to motivate, and he knew how to encourage and promote and bring the best out of people. I work for other individuals. If I mention Richard, you could probably put a last name to that. He was very nice to work for. He, uh, he was uh, no pushover, but uh, he was an individual who had my best interests at heart, and he encouraged me. I remember working for one man who uh, only counted success by the number of people basically he could squelch. And uh, he proceeded to squelch me. And uh, I was young enough and naive enough, I, I didn't even recognize that sort of personality type. Didn't recognize him as a sort of, uh, he was a sort of individual who, uh, uh, if there wasn't a crisis to solve, then he didn't feel it was meaningful. And so he would create a crisis and uh, he would explain to you why you were probably the problem or you needed solving or you were the crisis. And uh, of course, the more you try to please somebody like that, the more they perceive it as weakness. And so I, I worked in a situation like that. And uh, fortunately, it wasn't too long, but uh, uh, a year can feel like a decade in circumstances like that. And I found myself, I moved on and uh, I counted uh, uh, the blessings that came my way in the following years. Uh, but uh, I never forgot the individual he was, and I wonder, how will, how will that work out? And uh, sure enough, you know, God eventually rectified those things and sorted themselves out. But I remember uh, the feelings that I had and how they would swirl back and forth in me. Lord, strike him down with a thunderbolt. But, you know, don't put my name on it, you know. <laughs> Don't hold me responsible for, for that. Uh, the irony of it is, of course, uh, he, he died. I thought of him again here uh, uh, in the last year because he died. And I thought, isn't it funny now that I'm through towards the end of my life and he's ended his. Where does this thing lead us? Uh, into the presence of the one who is the judge of all mankind. Uh, I think he learned certain things later in life because you know, if uh, he certainly had uh, slapped a few people down and hurt a few people, I think it came back in spades uh, that uh, he did not escape judgment himself. But you work through those circumstances and you realize that we, do no, we no longer regard anyone from a worldly point of view. When a rubber hits the road, it's not just a philosophical thing like, well, there's Vladimir Putin, I guess God will work in his life and eventually he'll look back and he'll say, wow, oh, look at all the dumb things and the hurtful things I did. Uh, I thought I was going to do great things for my people. And God will say, well, first of all, they're my people, not yours. And secondly, look at the result of all the things you did. You know, look back upon that and now consider the individual that I am. Uh, how much willingness were you going to show for sacrifice, for servant leadership? Little, little things like that. Well, bring it down to very practical matters. How do I cope with uh, relatives or friends who disagree with me, who go in a different direction? I, as I said, I've known families where, and maybe it's because I get older and uh, more mellow, but uh, uh, I really have begun to uh, consider my people like my sister, and I only have one, my brother, I only have one, as a great blessing in my life. And I'm happy to share them with uh, my wife. I'm, uh, I consider my mother, who can be a personality, no more said, you know, just in case. Sorry, mom. Uh, uh, you know, uh, but 
you know, uh, you know, she's getting on in age, and I realize next year she's 90. And what a blessing that she is still alive and still a presence in my life, and how much I appreciate that. I do not uh, regard my brother and my sister and my mother from a worldly point of view. From now on, look at things through the eyes of the one who died for these individuals. And what a blessing they are to you. Though we once, in fact, looked at Christ that way, we do so no longer, he says. And he goes on to explain a little further. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Now, Christ has wrapped his arms around all of humanity. And once you respond to that, you are said to be in Christ. You sort of have to move towards it. You have to accept that. You have to accept the reality of atonement or reconciliation in the way that it works in my life. It's an accomplishment. He has really fulfilled it all. You know, sometimes as we look at human problems, we try to figure out how we're going to solve this or how we're going to work through that. And the uh, cliche that comes back to mind as I thought of some of the human circumstances that it affects uh, is the rather vacuous statement, for this I have Jesus. You know, you hear that, and you say, oh, yeah, okay, but how does that apply here? Well, Paul has just said, you see it through different eyes. You really have somebody who's telling you, this is not the way you handle it. This is not the way you feel about it. This is not the way you react to it. It changes you. You have been carried with Jesus into a relationship with the Godhead. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is something that calls to you and asks that you respond. All this is from God, who reconciled you and me to himself through Christ. And furthermore says, you need to model this. You need to share this ministry of reconciliation. And what is that? Well, God was reconciling the whole world to himself in Christ, not counting anyone's sins against them. And furthermore, he's committed to you and me this message of atonement, this good news. Uh, take it in. Try to process it. Try to ask how does this truth work out in all the areas of my life? And try to pass it along. In fact, he goes on to say, we are therefore Christ's representatives. And now he brings it back to a very practical matter, as though God were making his appeal through us. And now he says to the Corinthian church, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Accept the reality of this atonement. Make it work in your life. Change your feelings about your mom, about your dad who's departed, uh, about your brother, about your sister, about your children, about your grandchildren. The guy that you worked for who was a real, you know, crisis in your life about the neighbor that you lived next to, who at certain times was really obnoxious. Can you relate to that? Okay. All of these things, he says, be reconciled to God, accept the reality of how it works. And realize it flows from this. God made him who had no sin. He took it all. He wasn't just sort of forgiving sin. He became sin itself. He became our sin, just as surely as that goat took it all on himself and went out symbolically into the wilderness and was separated. Well, he carried that so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's, that's a strange statement, isn't it? It's so as if we live, we are a testimony of how right God is. We are living proof of God's righteousness because it flows through us. We are living proof. Who would have thought him, her, them? Wow. God did that for them. I can understand he did it for me. After all, I'm worthy. Right? 
But for him and him and him, whoa, we are all living proof of his righteousness. Reconciliation accomplished. And Paul putting it in practical terms to the Corinthian church, we implore you, start to understand the deep meaning. Look at the way you treat each other. Look at the way you speak of each other. Look at the stuff that spouts out your mouth. This is horrible. And I know the stuff that you're spouting. And of course, he quotes some of them back to you. Remember, his bodily presence is weak and contentable. Uh, you know, if, uh, if, he, if he'd only spruce himself up, uh, if he'd only, uh, you know, do something about himself. And of course, here the poor guy is representing himself to this church, and they don't perhaps think about the fact of what he suffered. You know, he squints because his eyesight is so bad. Uh, he speaks in a halting way because, well, he's been through a lot. And he's just not impressive. And all of these things were trotted out. You can read it, in, especially in the book of 1 Corinthians. His bodily presence is weak and contemptible. He just isn't our type, this sort of idea. And yet, he is saying, look, we are evidence of God's love in action. We are evidence of our Savior reconciling all the world to God in himself, in his actions. So reconciling, reconciliation accomplished is what I titled the sermon, uh, the job that Jesus has done. And it is now left for us to accept this accomplished reality, to embrace it, try to live it out, try to allow it to affect us, try to see change in our daily life. As I said, am I, how do I feel about the person who hurt me? How do I feel about the brother, the sister, the child, the parent? All of these are the immediate place where the rubber hits the road. Calls upon ourselves to look back and uh, consider, well, this is a different way of looking at things. As Paul said a few moments ago, we no longer view the world in a worldly way. We view it through the lens of the work of Jesus. And we are grateful for that. This is uh, kind of a different day. This is the last day that Ken McConaughey will be with us. Don't worry, he's not checking out. He's just going to Ottawa. We all have our burden to bear. But I thought it might be appropriate uh, today as we wrap up the sermon, maybe let Ken uh, ask God's blessing. Let's close in prayer. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, our dear God, we thank you for so, so many things, but one of the things that, uh, is that you have shared with us that's absolutely central to our understanding of you is that you are one God. There is but one, you are one God. And as we reflect on how it is the mechanism that you chose to use to save all mankind, which is to die for us because of the seriousness of sin, and yet you gave your life for us, just as people who love each other will lay their lives down for each other, you have done that for us. You didn't delegate it to um, sort of a number two God, you took that task and, and took that burden on yourself as a supreme act of sacrifice so that we all may live. So that when we speak of being in fear of God, we're not speaking in terms of being nervous and scared to be around you, but rather in total awe of God and perhaps fully aware of just how much more there is about you that we will understand and grow to understand someday. We just thank you for today's message, and we say this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Safe journey to Ottawa.